This is not the word. This is a bunch of words in it. But this is not the word. This reveals the word. In Greek, uh, what we translate word is logos. And logos means kind of like the concept of logo, which we have in English, right? This symbol that invites one in to see a reality. But in and of itself, is like a cipher. And in John's gospel, John refers to Jesus as the word, as the logos of God. And really, in my mind, what that means is, is that when we encounter Christ, much to James's point a couple weeks ago when he was still preaching with me, when we encounter Christ, that's a way of encountering God. And so we engage with these words that we might find a path to the word. In the Eastern Orthodox tradition, they have these uh, paintings that are called icons. How many of you are familiar with icons? So the idea of an icon is that you stare at an icon in supplication and worship and prayer, and that the goal is not to see the icon, but to see through the icon to encounter God. And so in the same way I think about scripture, this is not any more sacred than anything else. It only becomes sacred when it becomes a vehicle for us to encounter the living God. And so I don't want us to deify this, because this is too small for the God I serve. But this does give me a path to God. So I want to talk about good advice. Uh, what is good advice? How do you know if it's good advice? Not a rhetorical question. You follow it yourself. If you follow it yourself, <laughs> that's an answer. That is an answer. Uh, one piece of good advice that a uh, pastor gave me when I was just entering the ministry, he said, look, don't ever quote scripture at somebody that you don't need to hear. <laughs> and I was like, ooh, that's not a piece of advice a lot of people follow. That is a, that is foreign and new piece of advice. And I have kept that piece of advice in my back pocket. And every time I intend to quote scripture at somebody, I ask myself, do I need to hear this? Am I listening to this? And if I'm not, I don't do it. And it has meant that anytime I bring scripture, these words into the room, that I'm listening to them. I'm not just the caretaker of them who offers them to these lowly peasants who don't know about Jesus. I need to know about Jesus. Has religion ever offered you good advice? See, I think, you know, we live in Seattle, right? And so, generally speaking, the general attitude about religion is it's full of lots of advice that they don't take themselves. Right, that generally speaking, religion is more about grandstanding and making sure you get up here and look a little fancier and tell people how they should live. And, you know, a lot of this, right? Not a lot of this. Not a lot of this. And it's unfortunate. Uh, it's unfortunate that that's the way that often religion is, is thought about. But, you know, even members of this congregation, I have had conversations where somebody said, you know, you know what the Bible is to me, Pastor? It's just, it's a rule for how to live a good life. And I thought, have you read this thing before? Because that's not my experience. Can you tell me exactly where you're looking? And maybe they're, you know, thinking the Sermon on the Mount, for example, Matthew 5 through 7, which is a great place to get a lot of good advice. Um, but there's some questionable examples in the Bible that are about. Maybe not doing those things instead of doing them. Um, so I'm not I'm not a big fan of the concept of, of good advice as what our faith life should be like. I think good advice comes out of our experience. Maybe we get some rules, some understanding, some maxims, some some ways of being, some shorthand for how we want to be in the world. Now there's an alternative concept that I think is far more important for us which is good news. What is a piece of good news that you've received in the last month? And this is, I'm not trying to put a like religious like trickery on you. Like 
actually a piece of good news? What was the thing that you heard, you learned that was delightful? Yes. Awesome. That is a piece of good news. There'll be festivals and music and being a person that you trust and believe in is going to help steer that. That's fantastic news. Come on, seriously, we're not a bunch of dour mopes. What's some good news? My brother, who has been trying to have a side career as an author and has been writing for years, finally got his book published this week. So wow. that's fantastic. That's fantastic news. An aspiring author is now arguably an author. And he claimed that long before. <laughs> I would claim that too. It's like being a musician versus being a professional musician. Uh, whether you get paid for it or not, you're still a musician. What's well, one more piece of good news? Who can give me a, a piece of good news? It can be really small. I got uh, approached by a uh, reverend of another uh, faith, the Northern White Spiritual Center, and they may want to uh, share some space with us on Sunday afternoons. I thought that was really exciting. That's very cool. That's very cool. Good news. What is it? It's a piece of information that kind of creates a before and after. Things are different when you hear a piece of good news. Somehow the news is this information that, that something has changed. The world has changed somehow. That's what this actually is. In fact, if you look at the Gospels, right, the Gospel according to John, the Gospel according to Luke, the Gospel according to Mark, the Gospel according to Matthew, the word Gospel is just a fancy church word, just like narthex that no one uses outside of church. It really means the good news. Yeah, one word from, from Barb. Um, my student who has been in a reform school, returned to my class last week. I am so excited that he is ready to return. Oh man, she got a student back from reform school, back in her classroom, but that is fantastic news. And it's fantastic news for all of us because Barbara is a grace-filled and loving teacher who is very competent. And I believe and trust that that child will receive love and care and affirmation and growth uh, in ways that are unique to the gifts that Mrs. Edwards can give in the classroom. Good news is important. In our faith, it is the center that these writers produced good news, something they wanted us to know the world was changed. Now, transfiguration is another one of those ridiculous words that you only use in church. Like, when have you ever heard somebody talk about something being transfigured ever outside of the church context? <laughs> Straight up never, right? Straight up never, which is also weird because the Greek there is metamorpho, which sounds a lot like the word. And you hear that all the time, right? A science context. Talk about this like a ridiculous juxtaposition. What if you read this as was metamorphosed? And suddenly Jesus was metamorphosed before the human imagine giant butterfly. Coming out of Jesus, right? Which would be kind of amazing, right? That needs to be a logo for a church somewhere. <laughs> when the caterpillar undergoes metamorphosis, is it a different creature? I think it is. There's something weird that happens in the cocoon. It turns into a completely liquid. Right, but is it fundamentally a different creature? Yeah, right? We look at the caterpillar and we look at the butterfly and we look at the pulpy mess in the middle and we say, those are different things. I'm free. Am I getting you? Am I going to leave a hint there? <laughs> God, Jesus, Holy Spirit, Trinitarian theology, all three of the same thing, uh, all the same substance, but different form. We can get into this if we wanted. I don't really want to play in this pool. I just want to say, Jesus doesn't become different here. It's a revelation about Jesus that changes 
And it changes in the minds of these three people, the only people to witness this. But what's funny about it is they don't actually change for a while. They still are arguing about who gets to be first, and they're still arguing about what the Messiah is supposed to look like, and they're still denying Jesus, and they're still not quite on board yet, which is why he tells them, don't talk about this till after the resurrection, because you won't understand what the good news is until then. You won't, you won't get this yet. You're not, you're not ready for this yet. But this is like a seed I've planted in you. A seed that God has planted in you that will make sense later. And sometimes that's how good news is. We don't see it as good news at the time until later we come to realize, oh, wow, I'm really glad that happened. That prepared this other thing. The world is different somehow in the encounter with Christ. I will argue, at least it has been for me, that, that Jesus is good news in my life and that things are different now. And what this story is telling us is that the law and the prophets, you've heard this in one of the songs, the law and the prophets all hang together on Jesus. Now, if you've ever looked at how long the Hebrew Bible is and how complicated it is and how many different storylines there are, and then you try to say, what is it all about? And what does it tell me about how I'm supposed to live? It's gonna, it's a struggle, right? And Paul in particular is really interested in this struggle. And he's the only other person in the New Testament that uses the word metamorpho, and he uses it in two contexts. And so I just want to read them to you and hang some of this together. This is from Romans chapter 12. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed, metamorpho, by the renewing of the mind so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and well-pleasing and complete. And again, from 2 Corinthians chapter 3, he says this, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And all of us, with unveiled faces, seeing the glory of the Lord, as though reflected in a mirror, are being transformed, into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, the Spirit. This transformation is a liberation. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. There is a coming out, a revealing and opening up. And I don't know how many of you have experienced this in your own life and in your own faith journey. But this is that transfiguration that I think that the, the witnesses, the gospel writers, and Paul were really trying to articulate is that there's something that happens in us when we encounter the truth about Jesus, the truth ultimately about love. Because as 1 John tells us, God is love. And if Jesus is a perfect manifestation of God, then Jesus must be a perfect manifestation of human love. And you notice what's so interesting when you start encountering and trying to live out an ethic of love. It is so simple and so difficult. Just like all of the advice, think about how hard it is to really authentically, clearly love someone. And how much you have had to grow in your capacity, ability, and willingness to love other people. There are some people it's been easy peasy. And some people you realize you only love them about that much. And then when self comes over, it's like, oh, well, I'll see you later. Right? And some people it's been hard to love them from the start. They're annoying, they're kind of smelly, they're really frustrating. I mean, that sometimes I have this struggle too. And you, I come back to Jesus. I mean, for me, one of those pieces of good advice is I just wonder if Jesus was sitting next to me, how would he be showing up in his body? How would he be showing up in his face? How would he be showing up in his hands? Do I have the willingness and the strength to show up that way? And am I convicted when I don't? Jesus is the cipher for right relationship with God in my life, in my mind. And I had all of these folks over the last five weeks come here and talk to you about what is the good news as they understand it. 
what has been the transformational experience that they've had with this Christ? And if you break it all down, all of them were talking about different things, but ultimately they were talking about the same thing, which is our ability and willingness to grow in our capacity to love. Your faith night is not what you believe or what you think. It is not intellectual assent to any one piece of this. That is not your faith life. We talk about this a lot in this church, but the, the center is exactly trust, not belief. Belief is a poor translation of the word pistis in Hebrew, which is to trust. Do we trust in God? Do we trust in love? Do we trust that love will actually always be? That it will actually always make every situation better. That it will actually always make us more full and complete and full. Do we know how to love? Do we know how to set boundaries in love? This is what our faith life is ultimately about if you're following Christ. So the question is is Jesus, is his presence, is his love, is his Legacy and also his energy, good news for you. Is it a transformational experience for you? Is it advice that you are willing to take? Has he transitioned from just being a good teacher with a lot of good information, who has good advice, to being a savior who is good news for you and your community and the world? What you think on that? I'll see how it plays this level sometimes.